Paul's conversion story. This is the, the dramatic point in Paul's life when his life took an immediate and abrupt turn. And everything changed for Paul. We're going to look at that, and we're going to ask uh, a few questions of ourselves, but I'm going to remind you of my preaching style. In case you have forgotten, I don't always get from point A to point B in a straight line. So, I've been told that sometimes I tend to, to confuse people and they don't know how I'm going to bring it all together. Just today, just know I'm going to be doing, I might be doing the same thing. It feels like I'm kind of all over the place. Thankfully, though, as we look at Paul's conversion story, we're going to be looking at ourselves and asking about ourselves. Where are we positioned and are we listening? We're also going to ask about our position. Is it the right position? Do we need to evaluate where we are and move? So let us begin with prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks today for your word and pray that your spirit would illuminate your word that we would see and understand a bit more clearly, that it would become a light unto our path and help us to follow you more closely. Lord, may the words of my mouth today be of you. May they quicken hearts and change lives. But God, anything that is not of you may be quickly forgotten and do no harm. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we read the passage every week, we're, there's always a point when we have to stop and ask, what is it that we need to know? What is it that the scripture is telling us? What is it that it's telling us today? What did it mean back then? What is it telling us? What is it that we need to know? Today the passage is telling us something that, quite honestly, when I say it, I, I know that I'm going to lose a few people. They're just going to immediately tune me out. Perhaps that's kind of normal. Perhaps it happens every week. I, I get that. But what the scripture is telling us today it's something that we don't like to hear. We might argue and say, you know what, we don't really think that. But I'm going to say we live it. So here's what it is that we need to know today. The scriptures today are telling us it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not all about you. It's not about us. It's not about me. I guess you can ask how we get there. I'll be glad to show you. Just hang on. Who's the main character of today's story? Paul or Saul? No, he's not. The main character of the story is Jesus. Now, I get it. I get. It. I'm asking a question that you know you think you'd find with the uh, the kids up front. The preacher in the in, in, in the time of doing a children's moment one day sat down with the kids and said, "Okay, kids, now listen. I've got." I got a question for you. What is small and brown with a little fluffy tail that likes climbing trees and eating acorns? And one of the little boys raises his hand and says, Pastor, Pastor, I know, I know. Pastor says, okay, what is it? He goes, I know, I know it sounds like a squirrel, but the answer is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then kind of when I set up the question of who the story is about, it might be one of those questions where you like, I know the answer should be Paul, but I mean, I know it sounds like Paul, but the answer should be Jesus. But no, the, the answer really is Jesus. Our inability sometimes to see the main character of the story means that we also have a, an inability in our own lives to see who the main character of our, of our own life is. Our struggle is very real. We want to believe that it's about me. We want to believe that life and church is about me, about us, and it's not. We like to believe that we're the center of our own story, but we're not. If I were to, to, if I were to ask each and every one of you individually, what your life is about, who's the main part of your life, who's the center of your story, None of you would say, I am, to me, because you know the answer shouldn't be that. You wouldn't answer and say, I'm the main person in the story, because you know that it shouldn't be you, that, that you're taught that at a young age, your parents teach you that, your church teaches you that. But the problem is, is that we still live into that reality quite naturally, and sometimes by conditioning. We know this to be true, not by what we say, but by how we live, how we act. So this is a nature 
that we face, and it's, it is natural for us. Have you ever watched little kids play? Kids who haven't been taught to be greedy or selfish or selfless and sharing. Some kids naturally pull all the toys to themselves, and some kids share. But we learn, we know at a very young age that that's about us. But then that's reinforced for us, too. It's called advertising. It's called life. We're constantly told that it's about you, that you're the center of the world, the center of the universe, and you need to make yourself happy. And we're advertised day in and day out to that end. At some point, we have to recognize this nature and this conditioning, and we have to work against it, and it requires reprogramming. And we have to shift our focus. Today, I want to use two authors and two books that seemingly don't fit in with the discussion. We're going to talk about Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, a very godly and scriptural book, right? <laughs> We're also going to talk about Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I like how they tie in. They help us to look at Paul and see him a little bit differently. Like I said, don't try to figure this out just yet. I really drive a straight line. And Stephen Covey's book, when I first read it, the first part of it, as it always is, the first part stuck out to me quite a bit. He gives this story about a time when he was on a subway. Let me read the story to you. He says, I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some reading with, uh, resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm and peaceful scene. Then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, and yet the man sat next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive as to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else in the subway was feeling irritated as well. So finally, with what I felt was an unusual amount of patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are just really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little more. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and softly said, you're, you're right. I guess I should do something about that. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know uh, how to handle it either. Can you imagine what I felt in that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently, and because I saw differently, I thought differently, I felt differently, I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about, my, about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died. I am so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? Everything changed in that instant. But as we read this story, we can easily put ourselves and understand his position very quickly. We get it. When kids are rambunctious, somebody needs to take control of those children. They're a nuisance. They're bothersome. And we, how many of us have been in that situation before? <laughs> we know that. We know that feeling. And, and, and then if we do speak up, which, let's face it, often we don't. When we do speak up, don't we feel that we are being restrained and, and, and we're being uh, kind when we talk? I'm sure if, if the camera was on us, we probably weren't as calm as we thought we were or as restrained as we thought we were. And I can only imagine that as he's watching this and he responds to this man, he probably wasn't as restrained as he thought he was. So we can put ourselves and see ourselves in this story, in this situation very easily. But then the twist, the revelation, the reality of this man's life just changed. And all that irritation, 
all of that frustration evaporated in a moment. No longer was he upset and, and, and angry with this man for not controlling his children. All of a sudden, things looked very different, and he had compassion, concern, care. We like to think that the world exists for us. Even in, in our heart, in our head, we say it doesn't. We still struggle because we do think it revolves around us. The church is here because we've worked so long and so hard for this church. We have shaped its, its formation over the years. We have worked and slaved on the property and in the programs and in the care. And this is our church. It is where we identify ourselves. And without meaning to, it becomes about us. And the truth is, the church isn't here for us. The church exists so that others who do not know about God's love can come to know of God's love. Now, I know some might say, but pastor, the church also exists for my growth, too. To which I would say, while you're not wrong, when we move the focus from caring for others and we move it to your growth, we lose both. We lose both. So what is it that we're called to do? So if we have identified that, that the passage is somehow telling us, which I haven't revealed to you yet, somehow telling us that it's not about you, the question is what are we supposed to do about it? And the answer is for to submit. Paul was following God as best as he could. I mean, Paul was, he tells us other places, he was the Jew of Jews. He was very dedicated to the service of God. And in this dedication to God, he's going around and doing what he thought he should. These people who are a disruption need to be controlled. They need to be corrected. And he was very vigilant and willing to do that. The revelation, God saying, you're not persecuting people who are astray. You're persecuting me. In that moment, Paul's life changed. We like to think that the church is about us. Now, I'm not saying that we're going around and, and harming people. That's not my point. But we like to think that the church is about us. We're too invested in the church for it not to be about us. And what I want to say is that, that we also need a paradigm shift, and desperately. How many people here want to be liked? So I had a few people go, you know, of course they'd be like. Let me rephrase the question, make it a little bit more simple. How many here don't want to be like? How many here want to be despised? Raise your hand. <laughs> right? Nobody here wants to not be liked. We all want to be liked. And so we work in our lives to help people like us. I like reading books because in, in reading, you learn about things that you kind of look at and you watch. oh, yeah, duh. That makes a lot of sense. Why didn't I think of that? It's kind of like when somebody invents that one little thing, that one little gadget that took nothing to make and makes that person lots of money and that changes all of our lives and we all go, I could have thought of that. <laughs> when we read books, we come, we come across ideas and we go, oh yeah. I read Dale Carnegie's book as a young man and, and it, it's a small book, easy to read. If you haven't read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, it really is a good book. And as I read it, I went, well, Gosh, that makes sense. And it gave me a little twist and a turn to help me understand more about what I'm trying for, what I want, and how to get it. Dale Carnegie, in his book, writes that there are six ways to help people like you, to make people like you. I'm going to paraphrase these six. He says, number one, be, become genuinely interested in other people. Number two, smile. Number three, remember that the person's name to that person is the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Number four, be a good listener. Number five, talk in terms of the other person's interest. And number six, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Become genuinely interested in the other person. Find out about the other person. So often we're so busy talking about ourselves that we never hear or talk about the other person. Nothing turns us off more individually when somebody comes up to us and wants us to know all about them. We tend to shut them down. Number two, smile. Well, of course. Nobody likes talking to somebody who's frowning all the time. 
Nobody wants to talk to someone who's sour. Number three, remember a person's name. It is so important. How many are good at remembering names? I really wish I was better. Those who are good, that's a gift. Those of us who aren't good, learn how to be better. It makes a difference. Be a good listener. That's something many of us struggle with. We're so busy and engaged in whatever being said, we so want to respond that we can stop listening and we engage more than we should. And just like before, we think we're listening, we think we're doing good. And if there was a camera on us, we would see that we weren't so good. We weren't so good at listening and we did a whole lot of talking. But when we listen, we talk, and we talk, especially we're talking about their interests and about them. Number six happens by default if you're doing the other five. You make the other person feel important. But we have to do that in ways that are sincere. People see through things that are not sincere. These six are helpful. As I read them the first time, I kind of went, well, that makes sense. I guess I kind of knew that, but I never really thought, never articulated, I never put it together. How many here said today in your minds, yeah, that does make sense, of course. <clears throat> I told you that it's not all about you. The danger of saying that it's not about you is that somehow I'm saying you're not important. And that's not what I'm saying. When I say it's not all about you, that's actually not correct either. You're vital. You're dearly loved. God dearly wants to know you more and more every day. He wants to get closer with you every day. The church, I said, exists for those who don't know God's love yet. And that's very true. The church is here for a purpose. We're here to continue to share God's love. That's what Christ sent us out to do. God said, just as, Christ, uh, just as God sent me, I send you. God sent Christ into the world to help the world to know of his love, of God's love for the world. And that's exactly why Christ sends us out, that others might know. The conundrum is that it's not about you and it's all about you, all at the same time. I know it sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but again, you're vitally important. The big question that we face is, how do we structure our lives appropriately so that we can be known as well as making God known to others and helping others to know God. The unexpected answer that I have is that we get what we want when we take care of others. We get what we want and what we need. We get to feel important. It becomes about us when we're doing the work that we're called to and helping other people know about God better. And this is where Carnegie ties in so well. When we turn things around, when we make it about the other person, when we get to know somebody, when we become that friend to somebody, what do we find? We find that we are liked as well. What we really want is to be liked and loved and respected, and when we give that to other people, when we share that love with other people, we get it back. Christ met Saul on that road to Damascus. Saul who wanted to serve God. Saul who wanted to do what was right and best was encountering Christ on the road in a way that was so dramatic and so over the top, leaving him blind for three days. Christ says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, the man who was wanting to, to serve God, found himself in a paradigm shift realizing he wasn't serving. And so he shifted his focus and attention. We in the church, we want to feel important. We want to be, uh, to be excited about church. We want this to be our place. We want it to be about us. And if we shift just a little bit to make it about other people, we find that all that we're wanting, we also get. How many here have ever taught a class? So many of you have. The truth about teaching is, who learns more, the student or the teacher? The teacher. Isn't that a little bit backwards? Did you know that going into teaching? Or were you pleasantly surprised to find that as you're giving to other people, you found you got more? As we go and try to take care of the needs of others, we're going to find our own needs met in abundance. It truly is one of those win-win situations 
Today's sermon title is, Who Deserves the Glory, Not Us? By giving the glory to God, by reaching out and sharing that glory to other people, we find that all that we're hoping for, we get. And it happens in the best of ways. Not because we demand it, not because we grab for it, not because we fight for it, but because we oddly give it away. And it comes back. Saul's life turned around when he heard and submitted to Christ. I hope for every one of us that nobody here today has a Damascus Road experience. I often pray, God, I love it when you talk to me. Please put the two by four down. I don't need it anymore. I pray that that's true, but I know me. I'm a little stubborn. I just pray I never have a Damascus Road experience. Moses had a burning bush experience. That would be nice. I wouldn't mind that so much. That wouldn't hurt so much. I would even settle for, settle for a smoking weed, and I'm not talking about the California kind. <laughs> but I pray that none of us have a Damascus Road experience. May we so be listening to God, so in prayer, so in communion with our Lord, that we can hear when God is talking to us and that we would be able to shift ourselves just enough to focus on the right things just enough that we not only give to others what they desperately want to need, that we get and so much more in return. Paul's road experience, or Paul's experience on the road to Damascus is, is a light to all of us. May we stop for a moment this week and ask God, what is it in my life that needs a change where I can make other people the main focus of your story? And then be surprised in the ways it comes back to you. I pray for us this week. To God be the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks for your word for the experiences that are captured for our reading and understanding and our direction. May this week be a week of, uh, of revelation for all of us. And we give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen.